You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. Today, Father Paul begins his discussion of Genesis chapter 8 by emphasizing the scriptural priority of the animals, differentiating between the creatures of the sea, the creatures of the ground, and the birds of the air, the latter being of special importance. He also touches again briefly on the mention of Ararat, which he explains appears in the story as a clear indication of the Syrian desert. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Chapter 8 is the high point that reflects my view and thesis. The priority of the animals and their importance. I said it several times that it's the human beings that have to live the animalic life as in the setting of the Syrian sheep flock. So let's not go into modern science and ecology and zoology and so on. I leave it this for the other people. We can't spend our time on that. If you want to ask me about it, I'll tell you how we can apply it. But the main thing is to remember the priority of the animals. And in this case, we have right from the beginning the stress on the birds. Birds are very interesting. They are sky animals, but they are still ultimately land animals because they have to come back and be on earth, which does not apply to the sea animals. So let's differentiate between these three as Genesis 1 very astutely did. Okay, we have the sea and its denizens. We have the ground with the Adam and the Basar, the other animals, the big animals and those who creep on earth and so on. And then you have the birds. And here in this chapter, we have very important activity of the birds, one of them being the raven that will appear in the story of Elijah. So here again, we see how things are interconnected. But let's go through the chapter and let's spend some time on that as we did on chapter 7. And we'll go through the verses. And God remembered Noah. That's very important. I believe my last podcast ended on that, that it is God who is ultimately the one who rules everything. But what is interesting that he remembered not only Noah, but all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. Okay, and God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. So we can hear again how the function of the spirit is very important because it can go this way and it can go in the other way. He let a wind. And the original is Waya Aber, it's the Hifil of Abar. He made pass. Okay, here we go. And I'm pointing this because this chapter is very rich with verbs that are used before and after. So I'm going to make quick comments for the general hearer that it's not as simplistic as it sounds in the translations that give the impression that you're watching a Hollywood movie. He made a wind to pass over the earth. Okay, that wind is the ruah that passes, and the water subsided, and then the fountains of the deep, the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. So it is under the will of God that these things happen. And then we hear that the waters returned off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. So 
it's the opposite movement of the water and slowly on it's very nice in the text that the way we heard that the waters rose and then rose and rose now they abate and they are rested in the 17th day of the month above the mountains of ararat i made my comments on ararat so i do it very quickly now it's a very clear indication of the area of the Syrian desert it's actually the area of the sources of the two rivers that go down along the Syrian desert so there is no other explanation why would the author decide to mention ararat and i discussed this in detail in my book and then again the waters decreased continually until the 10th month okay we hear it again and again and again and then at the end of 40 days which is a classic time the fullness four times 10 that noah opened the window and how would he check now one can see or hear the importance necessity centrality of the birds before we hear about the other animals the human being and even the vegetation they are really the hinge that would lock the knowledge about the vegetation which is the basis of life and the human beings and the animals and it went back and forth until the waters were dried up from off the earth okay we have the use of earth here and then in the following verse we have the use of ground but again it's very interesting that with verse 8 in conjunction with the ground we hear about the dove which is yona which is peace and that's life blessing okay the raven is something else but the dove is much more important and with it we have the use of the ground adama at the end of verse 8 and nice story but the soul found no rest for the sole of her foot and she returned unto him into the ark for the waters were on the face of the whole earth then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her out unto him into the ark okay ground and earth practically as i say time and again it's the same thing but one should be very careful as to one what he is adama always reminds us of adam and he stayed another 7 days uh, again the fullness of the divine time and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark and the dove came into him in the evening and in her mouth was a plucked olive leaf that is very important okay so vegetation is budding on the ground on the earth and noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth that was the sign of life and thus the dove the peace the new beginning and he stayed yet another 7 days and sent forth the dove just to make sure which returned not again unto him any more that's a positive sign which means that the dove was able to sustain itself with the vegetation that was there so again very astute story very interesting you know the birds uh, technically are not part of the flock they are signs in habits and even civilizations older civilization use that and you know you see them even now in the movies when you see a buzzard suddenly there must be a carcass and so on. it's something like that they help you to see what's going on and the important thing here is that the bird the dove in this case does not need the ark anymore that's the main point it can sustain itself outside the ark and without it okay and there we hear it very clearly in verse 13 that we have the first year the first month the first day of the month it's unmissable it's a new year it's a new beginning it's a new era and so on and so forth i mean to the ear it's very important to realize 
Now, this will become important. Let me do the jump at the end, where this repetition of the year as we have it in our tradition, Happy New Year, is very important. I'm going to jump to the last verse after God decides not to curse anymore in verse 21. I want you to hear verse 22. While the earth remains, he is speaking of God. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Very powerful. Okay. And the verb cease again is Shabbat, a verb that means to stop, to cease. Another example, I have a few more about the connection of the verbs, the original. We heard Habar earlier, we hear Shabbat here. However, my point is the repetition. That's how life is on earth. It's not exciting every time something new. The novelty is that we are back to the same season in which we were last year. And that's good news. The change in the matter of nature is bad news. Suddenly you have the flood, which was not supposed to be there. So let's go back to 13. And Noah removed the covering of the heart and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. But this dry is from the root harab, which I referred to last time, that it's a little bit the expression of rubble. You know, in Hebrew, we have different names for desert wilderness. One of them is horba. Okay. It's dry, fine, but it's still not expressive of the full, if you like, regular life. Why? Because if you don't have the animals and the human beings moving around, then it's a rubble. Last time I mentioned to you that until now in many of the names of towns in Arabic, herbit and then something, the rubble of something. Usually it's an indication that there were buildings there and so on. It's like in Arabic, tell. It's a rubble that was covered by sand and you see a mound. Okay. Important to realize how these words rang in the ears of the original hearers. And this is where we're supposed to make the effort. And in the second month, on the seventh day, the earth was dried. Okay, this is where we have the yabesha, which is the verb that we heard in Genesis 1. So one more time, notice the movement from hor harbu. It's a plural because the faces of the earth, the face of the ground. And now we move into the yabash, which is the good thing, the basis of life, as we heard about it in Genesis 1. And God said to Noah, go forth from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wife with you. Again, please, my hearers have to notice that there is a movement in the text that God did not allow Noah to come out with his family and with the animals until the earth was reinstated in its dry status that we heard of in the beginning of Genesis 1. The horba is not enough to sustain life. So very ingenious, I think it's much more than astute, very powerful, but all this cannot be perceived except in the original. And, uh, you know, I cannot repeat it enough. I mean, the Muslims have to be our masters in this. If you don't hear the Quran in Arabic, you're not hearing the Quran. You're hearing something else. And that is really central. And I hope I will be able to show this in the podcast, stress it again and again. I'm hoping that if 100 hearers of my podcast will decide to learn Hebrew, I think that would be the greatest blessing for the future. Anything else is just pure fake 
theology. You just say whatever you want to say by suddenly speaking about pets like the dogs and the cats and so on. This was not in those times, okay? Definitely not in the Syrian wilderness. So very important that we have you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. Remember, I keep repeating. The sons are not enough because now we have a total new beginning for the humanity. In other words, there are no more people. We're not anymore in chapter one, two, three, where Ha'adam meant everybody. Here, the everybodies are precisely the people who are in the ark. And then bring forth with you every living thing for those interested, you know, that God asked him to Hotse, which is the hifail of the verb yatsa, which means to go out, to make something go out. And you could hear already the jump to the Exodus. We mentioned the connection between the flood and the Exodus through the use of teba. When I said it's the basket, it's not the ark as we have it in the translations. It's the same word that we find in Exodus. And here we have to make them go out the way God will make his people go out. Everything with you, one more time. And the everything is all flesh, which is the Hebrew basar. One more time, basar is the meat of all kinds of animals, the way even now in the restaurants. You have chicken, or animal meat and so on, two kinds of meats and the birds, okay? Chicken is considered a bird. So all that has meat is basar in Hebrew, every basar. And then we have the enumeration, which is very interesting. Birds, notice how they are number one. Animals, every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, okay? It's the same order that we heard of in Genesis 1, that they may breed abundantly and multiply. Now, very interesting that this breed, sharas or sharats, is the verb that is used about the breeding things even in the sea in Genesis 1, this is where it is found. And it is used again here. And I'm going to show you the importance of that verb. And be fruitful and multiply upon the earth, which are the two verbs that are used in Genesis 1. But please remember this sharats. It's going to appear two verses later in a very interesting way. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Notice the repetition. That's very important in the stories that come from the Middle East and the East. It's not that, oh, we already said it before. No. The hearer has to hear it. Otherwise, it is as though something is missing and the hearer is going to say, where are the others? And here we have to learn, as you hear it so often in my presentations on the MP3s, that we have to learn to hear stories the way the children at the age of two and three in bed before sleeping. You cannot cheat on them. If you skip two pages, something is missing because there is an element that's going to be used later. And the child is going to tell you, and where is the doggy? So please. I mean, you may smile, even laugh, that's fine with me. But I'm convinced, unless we do this effort, we're not listening to the biblical text. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.